And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, creator of the upcoming Gast Bashers, and a man I am grateful for for not chewing me out when I messed up the, the name when I, when I contacted him, the library NPC himself, Anthony Domenico. How you doing today, man? I'm doing well. How are you doing? I am, do I am doing good. It is nice and not sunny out, which is a plus in my book. Oh yeah, once that day star goes down, the fun begins, right? You know what you know what they you know what they say about when the cats are away. I mean, there's plenty of options there. You gotta be a little more specific for me. The mice will play. Yeah, well, that's a normal one. <laughs> yeah. Um. So a a um, I like to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. So with that in, with that in mind, I'd like you to walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what was it that made it stick i uh my first experience with role playing games uh occurred in the summer of either 98 or 99 it's a little fuzzy at that time uh had a lot of uh things going on in life changes moving loss in the family you know a lot of stuff happening um and i was spending a chunk of the summer with my friend mark and while we were cleaning out the attic, we stumbled upon his uh, dad's red book set of Dungeons and Dragons. So we're talking uh, old school, you know, uh, player's guide and DM book, like the little tiny soft cover red books. Yeah, the the and, me days. Mm -hmm. So we uh, we had a set of those, and of course we just dove right into it because this looked interesting. We wanted to know how it worked. And uh, we gathered up our pocket change and went down to the gaming store that was way down the road, picked up some dice, and we taught ourselves how to play D&D. &D. And from there, it just, it just evolved. Uh, it opened up doors uh, to telling a different kind of story and a different kind of gaming for me. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, my friend Mark and I, we kind of went in different directions with Tabletop. But I'm glad to say that uh, all these years later, we are both still in the hobby. And I am very grateful to know that uh, that one experience there is what got us to stick to it. Yeah. And when and when it come now, um, would you would would you say what? I know you mentioned that Redbox was kind of, was kind of your intro, but were you were you somebody who was a one system guy for for a majority of it, or did you jump around between systems? Uh, a little bit of column A and a little bit of column B. Uh, what? So again, you know, at that time I was uh, going through some life changes. Uh, we had just moved to a uh, rural part of Pennsylvania. Uh, if you're familiar with uh, Yingling beer, it is made in Pottsville, Pennsylvania, which is in Schuylkill County, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. Anyone who's uh, lived in Schuylkill County knows there's really not much there. So anytime you could find something uh, in the nerd variety in the late 90s and early 2000s, you just grabbed it. Mm -hmm. So in my case, I uh, hit every used bookstore, used, uh, you know, all the comic shops, and uh, farmers markets and everything else like that I could, as well as some of the uh, game and nerd shops in some of the local college towns, and slowly built up a collection of different games. Um, so again, started off with like the, the Red Book set, but then expanded into Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, picked up Third Ed when it came out, um, and like that, you know, AD and D was my focus for a while, but I still dabbled with 3.0, which wasn't really my bag. Uh, did the Star Wars D20 for a while, and uh, also was uh, thanks to having internet access at school, I got into some other games like Fusion from Artalsorian Games, mm -hmm. and that was just a blast to get into at the time, just because of all the anime references in there, 
and being a uh, you know one of the old guard otaku before we had the term weeb, uh, it was just it was great seeing that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And then once I got out of high school, and you know had the whole you know the ability to order things online with my own money and everything else like that. Yeah, uh, that's when the doors really flung their way open, and I was able to start tracking down other things on the joys of uh, eBay and Amazon in the early aughts, and just slowly built and expanded from there. Mm-hmm. So yeah, just uh, over the years, it was. Uh, it looked like D and D was going to be my one mainstay game uh, for the first couple years, and then as I got my hands on more and more systems, it just kept expanding. Uh, so, like, for example, in high school, it was just D&D, and then a little bit of dabbling in Fusion. And then when college hit, uh, it was, sure, it was D&D, but then it was also World of Darkness, 7th Sea, and uh, the homebrew hacks my friends and I were working on. And then I went uh, overseas for a year and picked up, uh, what was it, uh, DSA, and uh, picked up the Magius games while I was living in Japan, and... I've uh, just, again, just picked up system after system and, you know, I'd stick with one for a while and then after a while, just pick up another one. Yeah. And that, br- that brings me to get to, um, Gast Bashers. Um, <laughs> oh, God. So, <laughs> for, so first off, um, I, you had mentioned this to me before we even started this kind of thing, but as I understand it, a fair few people have um, botched the name. <laughs> oh, plenty of times. If if I was offended by people botching a name, I wouldn't have friends because everybody's at least flubbed my own name on more than one occasion. So knowing that people are flubbing over the name Gast Bashers, I am not offended. Mm-hmm. I've had everything from uh, Gas Bastards. Yes, that phrase has actually come up in conversation. Uh, to, you know, Ghost uh, Bashers to... Uh, you just... You can imagine the sort of mix-ups I've been dealing with. And they're fun. Uh, I just lose track of them after the sixth one. <laughs> So, how did the how did the idea really come about? Uh, which part exactly? Do you mean mechanically or uh, the the gas bashers itself? We'll start with the we'll we'll start with the latter and 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 end with the former. Okay, so uh, starting with the latter. So how it came about to be gas bashers? Um, I'd been. Uh, kicking around uh multiple games and you know with uh pandemic and whatnot uh it's been hard to get an in-game person together and as i keep tinkering with mechanics and i just kept hitting a wall with it i just decided to put my stuff to the side and work on other side projects one of those side projects was putting together a ghostbusters outfit so i could join the local ghostbusters costuming group and, you know, do some of the charity work, you know, parades, children's hospitals, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And as I'm working on this, having a conversation with a friend of mine in the group, and I'm like, you know, I'm like, it really just bugs me that I'm struggling with trying to come up with something to play or to run or anything else like that, because nothing is appealing. And I look at my own game that I'm trying to build, like, you know, my fourth one here, and I'm just struggling with what to do with it. And, you know, as we were just soundboarding, she's like, dude, you're building a proton pack right now. Why don't you just make a Ghostbusters costume? Ghostbusters Afterlife, or Ghostbusters inspired game. Ghostbusters Afterlife is coming out later this year. You got the costume ready to go. You're super excited about this. Why not? And then at that moment, Anthony.exe had crashed. (laughs) I paused for a moment. I rebooted. And the first word out of my mouth was just a, you know, very blunt, fuck. <laughs> and that's when I realized that all the pieces fell into place. And uh, reached out to a couple friends of mine, specifically uh, Malgi and Nightlin, uh, both of whom I've uh, worked with for, our, for one of my previous games, Mainframe, mm-hmm. and told them the idea, <clears throat> told them what I needed, they're both on board, and then we got uh, 
our friend Bonk, the uh, Gas Basher logo, within just a couple days. And the game just evolved from there. Um, at first, I was just going to do a limited, you know, just a quiet release on Itch. But then we started getting more art ideas and then more discussion. And then we got the idea of let's turn this into a patch and then let's do this other side thing. And Malgi can make dice. So why don't we make some dice for this? And I said, you know, what? we have the, the makings of a Kickstarter. Let's do this and get some extra art. Mm-hmm. So that's how we got to the Kickstarter. And that's how we settled on gas bashers itself. So that that's how we reached the conclusion. Mm-hmm. You know, kind of anticlimactic when you think about the mechanics, which I've been kicking around for about fifteen years. Yeah. Uh, so what happened here with the mechanical side? Like every other tabletop gamer, home brewing is a way of life. You pick up a game, you play it. There's certain things you love, and then there's parts you just absolutely hate. You love the way how game A handles this, but you love the way game B handles this other aspect better. How can you put them together? Mm -hmm. So you start hacking bits of parts of games, put them together, get a Franken game. Sometimes it falls apart, but it's at least a fun experience. This evolved over years, and uh, I spent a year living in Nara, Japan from 2005 to 2006. Lived with some uh, people in the international student dorms. And one of the uh, international students, my friend Martha from Germany, she was really big into Das Vorzog, which is translated to The Dark Eye, which does have an English release. Um, and it's we jokingly call it Germany's answer to D&D. So it's just a typical fantasy role-playing game. But outside of the fantasy role-playing game, that's where the similarities end. Mechanically, under the hood, it was like the exact opposite. Because you're rolling multiple dice, you're rolling under instead of rolling over, you have an HP and an MP system, you had a DR system instead of an AC system, and it was just all these different parts that were really appealing. But in America, we only got the third edition at the time, which was utter garbage and didn't have a magic system or a good one. So that got me thinking, well, how can I learn from this and build? So that's when the game really started. That's when I started sitting down and experimenting with a roll low system mm-hmm. with a, um, you know, with uh, more than one uh, form of health, I guess we could say. And then just it continuously expanded from there. Stuck with medieval fantasy because that's what I knew at the time. Mm-hmm. But then I tried to add some of the modern elements because I was playing World of Darkness at the same time. Mm-hmm. Then I tried to add some sci-fi elements because I'm a Star Wars nerd, so why not? And like it just it kept growing out of hand. Next thing I knew, I had a game with what nine stats, thirty some odd skills. HP, MP, and stamina, and you know, and it was a point by system. It was an absolute catastrophe. Eyes bigger than your stomach. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I mean, I made a gelatinous cube look like it was starving in comparison. I just kept adding on to these parts, just kept bolting them on, hoping something would work, and it just kept getting out of hand. But at the time most of my gaming experiences were these power creep games. Mm-hmm. You know, when you think about it, you had, uh, you know, the games I was playing at the time, you had D and D of all editions. The D 20 system was big. Mm-hmm. You had world of darkness and multiple editions. You had seventh C and the L five R you had, um, God, what else was I playing at the time? Like I had just read my first version of uh, fudge at that time, which mm-hmm. I didn't really get at that point. And just, it was just all over the place. There was just this power creep, and they just basically caused my own. Well, you also mentioned fusion, which it, which is um, huge which power is, creep, which is cr- which is um, crunchier than a crunch bar. <laughs> and that's putting it politely. I mean, fusion's the epitome of rocket tag, and the thing I learned from fusion is don't do rocket tag. Um, and 
Not to be and I made sure rocket jumping. Do that. Oh yeah, absolutely rocket jump. Just don't rocket tag mm -hmm. because you know first person get the headshot wins is not a fun game mechanic unless your game is literally called rocket tag. Mm -hmm. But I digress. <laughs> So the point still stands, all these games I had access to and I was playing and I was reading and studying from were all these power creep, numbers keep going up games. Yeah, a lot of them just had very linear progressions and just, it got out of hand. So what I was building emulated all of that. And looking back on it all these years later, it really emulated the worst parts of everything instead of the best. Mm -hmm. But every couple years, I'd pick it back up. So I'd pick up new games. You know, I got into uh, the Fate system because of the Dresden Files uh, role-playing game that came out. Mm -hmm. I got into Cortex because of Marvel Heroic role-playing. <clears throat> I got into uh, the Genesis system because of the uh, Star Wars role-playing game from Fantasy Flight. Mm -hmm. And I did some playtesting for them for a while. So I really got to see some under-the-hood how mechanics are built and how they function and whatnot. So when you stare at the game that long, you learn something. <laughs> and then, you know, expand into other games like Cypher and uh, um, Powered by the Apocalypse and just started uh, backing more stuff on Kickstarter when I started doing more game reviews. Like, you just see how it just keeps expanding. And I started seeing more narrative-driven games. Once I realized that you could find a, a balance between narrative crunch or narrative elements and uh, mathematical crunch. That became my new goal. Mm -hmm. So I started removing all this extra fluff. I don't need 80 pages of advantages because why bother with point based advantages when I could use something like, you know, aspects or traits. Why do I need uh, an HP and MP system when I can have stats that go up and down on their own? Why do I need a 800-page magic rulebook of spells when we could just have narrative-based magic? And start borrowing from all these different things. Kept some crunch, kept some uh, narrative, and realized, okay, how can I make this work? And uh, it really came to light uh, last year when the shutdown hit. You know, uh, COVID-19 hit, the uh, government shutdowns were in place, no one was going anywhere. A good friend of mine, Bob Scary, reached out to me and said, I want to make a game. So let's make a game. I'm like, all right, let's do this. <laughs> and a couple months later, we, uh, you know, we were comparing notes. Uh, he pitched an idea. Uh, I went digging through my decades of failed projects, pulled parts of what matched what he was looking for, uh, used some stuff he really wanted in the game, and then we somehow pieced all of the goals together into something that worked, which is how we got to uh, Niche, which is the core system for Prisma Paladins. Powered by the Apocalypse adjacent, in the sense that it's a 2d6 plus mods. And outside of that, it just the similarities are pretty, you know, pretty narrow. You're not doing you're not doing playbooks, moves, or any of that kind of jazz. The uh, the closest thing we had to moves um, were in existence because of the high flying nature of uh, Sentai mm -hmm. and the. Um, Instead of playbooks, we uh, we had a card set up to where um, they're basically broken down by individual types, like your role uh, in the TV show. Like, are you a leader type? Are you a part of the team? That sort of thing. <clears throat> and you pick traits to go with them, as well as weaknesses to go with each one. So you literally built your character out of six cards. Mm -hmm. So no playbooks. You got six cards. And the closest thing to moves were just sample actions that you could throw out the window if you really wanted to and just keep the special moves that were included. Mm -hmm. We just had them in there as the default because, well, it just worked. <laughs> so, again, I, we view it as a, 
uh, PBTA adjacent and uh, inspired game, but not a powered by solely because there's enough difference there that it stands out. Mm -hmm. But then we, uh, after we built that, I looked at my other notes and said, you know, I still have more notes to work with. And then it just kept going. After you get the first one, it became habitual. And then I uh, hammered out a pamphlet game called Smack, uh, Saturday Morning Awesome Cartoons, mm -hmm. where you're literally playing like the action figures and toys from <laughs> Saturday Morning Cartoons. Mm -hmm. And then I, because uh, Niche is a good 80 some odd pages, and I wanted something much smaller, so I decided to challenge myself with a pamphlet game. And that was smack. And then I wanted to go a step in between. So I wrote a game called mainframe, which is inspired by the TV series reboot. And that use again, that nod between, uh, that nod to narrative elements mm -hmm. with a couple math crunches, but you know, funny, silly, etc. But that one was, uh, the game I wrote right before Gas Bashers because it was just a, it was nagging me. And I said, you know what, let's get it out of the way. Let's see how this mechanic works. It's not exactly what I wanted from these other notes. So let's write it. Mm -hmm. Give it the love it needs. And then go back to these old notes. So everything I've been writing has just been a spinoff of the notes that started over a decade ago. And just kind of evolved into their own individual games. Yeah. So that's that's you know convoluted way to say that uh, Gas Bashers is literally 15 years of creation, failure, overcomplicated mechanics, realizing this is a terrible idea, and then breaking off all the pieces from this monster and building actual working little machines. Mm -hmm. And Gas Bashers is the newest one. Now, given now given the given the given the fact that this is using a lot of a lot of not a lot of nodding to um get to go to Ghostbusters. Mm -hmm. Um, I one thing I'm curious about is did you have did you have any experiences with the two um official Ghostbusters RPGs that came out over the years? When you say two official Ghostbusters RPGs, are you referencing Ghostbusters and Ghostbusters International? Yeah. Okay, so Ghostbusters was, I believe, was it 85 or 86, and International was in 89. Uh, let me check. 86, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, Ghostbusters was 86, and Ghostbusters, and yep, Ghostbusters International was 89. Yep, uh, I have played both versions of the game uh, because it uses uh, West End Games D6 uh, role-playing game. Um, I was big into the Star Wars D6 game for a bit. So, of course, picking up Ghostbusters was just a, uh, you know, an expected thing I did. And while it was interesting, it... On one hand, uh, one of the reasons why I really decided I'm going to stick with making Gas Bashers here... We haven't seen a uh, like an actual officially Ghostbusters licensed game since '89, so we're talking what 32 years now? Some doing wait no, 22 years? Some no brain. Sorry, it's a day. <laughs> I can't math right now. <laughs> 32 years. So we're talking years since we've last seen a. Or, yeah, you know what I mean. Regardless, it's been years since we've seen a Ghostbusters licensed game. Yes. We've seen some Ghostbusters inspired games like Inspectors. Um, and if you are considering SCP as a Ghostbusters inspired resource, there's plenty of that. Inclu including the including the full on RPG that um, that. Mm -hmm. That came out not too long ago, and full disclosure, I've had the guy behind that on the show. <laughs> yep, um, I've actually uh, seen him on uh, a couple Q and A's that I've also taken part of, and seems like a decent enough person. Mm -hmm. I'm really interested in the project personally. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, it's just one of those. I I've played it, I enjoyed it. It just didn't 
I would like. And since we have all these other years of gaming tech under our belts, mm-hmm. I thought it was time for something different. Yeah. And, you know, again, with, uh, you know, Ghostbusters is just one of the elements inspired that is inspiring gas bashers because the uh, gas bashers are just one, uh, just one part of what's, you know, in store in the rule book. Mm-hmm. Now, give the big, re- the big reason that I wanted to ask on that is from what, from what I saw of the quick start and th- the way the sheets are set up, I get far more of a vibe of, um, of international than, um, than frightfully cheerful. Mm-hmm. Um, and granted, both, granted, both are fairly, li- are fairly light, get are fairly light games. And, um, I'd be remiss when, when it comes to this whole thing of successors to go to Ghostbusters, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention, um, Ace, um, which is, which is into works from EN world, the awfully cheerful engine. Mm. Um, but I do, but I do have to, I do have to, I do have to express my disappointment <laughs> for, for the fact that for the longest time I have had, I have had the running meme of the lonely D12 and <laughs> then I, then you come along and then a few other devs come along and you're killing my memes. <laughs> <laughs> that's actually been uh, another thing that's been coming up more and more lately. Uh, like I wanted to go with a D12 because it's it is the lonely, lonely 12 cider. It needs more love and appreciation. And people say there's not enough variance between it and the D10, but you could do so much with a D12 if you know what you're doing with it. Mm-hmm. And now I'm seeing a bunch of uh, of other like zine size games coming out, and then there was the. Uh, the wildly successful Kickstarter for Coyote and Crow, which is a D12 powered game. Mm-hmm. And uh, if I remember correctly, there was a Cthulhu powered game that was also a D12 game. So it's not like they're common, but I'm happy to see that there's enough of a cult following that's coming in and saying, no, our die will not be forgotten. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Um, but when, but, and of course, of course, some. Um... I'd be remiss if I didn't if when it comes to the whole D12 thing I didn't men- I didn't mention the the um stuff stuff like Blade of the Iron Throne using it although that's far on the other end of the cr- of the crunchy spectrum compared to what you're doing um, mm-hmm. largely by design um but when it com- but when it comes to when it comes to th- when it comes to the game now as as I understand it since it's vi- it's very much a zine based game um or a, a zine, st- a zine style game. I'll say not, there's not really a basis for z- for zines aside, aside mm-hmm. from Zine Quest, but we're out of season for that. Um, yeah. Your sh- your uh, as I understand it, you're going you're going for a si- a simple um, a simple approach with a lot of with a lot possibly with a bunch of optionals built around built around that. Is that accurate? That's pretty close to the mark. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh. Uh, the uh, what I'm trying to do with this is I have the core mechanic in place, which covers uh, less than half the book, mm-hmm. and then the rest of the book I've dedicated to a section of the book is just going to be the in-game lore, sample bestiary, you know, that sort of uh, situation, which explains uh, how the world of the Gas Bashers is different from our own world, you know, where the uh, where the timeline split, so to speak. Uh, you know, how the different organizations such as the Gas Bashers and BPI and the various sellouts were created, why the supernatural is in existence, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Explain all that. And then have a uh, GM section to go over the basics of not only how to run a game, <clears throat> but talk about the different kinds of comedy horror, offer up some sample options of... You know, uh, materials that you should be watching or reading for, you know, ideas and, uh, you know, campaign info, that sort of thing. But I wanted to provide a toolbox just as much as an actual game. Mm -hmm. Because I'm one of those people that I'm not going to hand you something and say, this is the only way it can run. I want you to take whatever I hand you and do whatever you want with it. I already have people telling me they would love to take the core mechanic 
and run Stranger Things. Or the, uh, what was it, the Magnus Archives is another big one that people have been talking about with it. Uh, another friend of mine said they could probably use it for Supernatural because of the way I'm handling investigation. And one of the core mechanics that I put into the game is a town clock element that I originally pulled from a failed kaiju game I was writing. Mm -hmm. So there's... It's a toolbox. It's a complete game that you can literally take and go, okay, what's an adjacent theme that I can use with this? And off you go. So I'm trying... That's why I'm still leaving it as a zine instead of a full rule book. I want it to be that line between a toolbox and a complete game. Mm -hmm. Now, within that D12 system, as, as I understand it, the way you have it working is you roll, you roll in, your skill determines how many D12 you roll, and mm -hmm. your attribute determines the number that you're trying to shoot <clears throat> under. Correct. Um, are there any, are there any, spe are there any special effects that happen when rolling ones or um, twelves? Uh, it's one of those uh, yes and no sort of situations. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have uh, a couple notes for uh, different types of crits, namely if it's a one or if it's uh, a roll equal to your skill rating. Because mm -hmm. let's face it, you know your chance of getting that is a one in twelve. You might as well enjoy it. <laughs> Yeah, and getting, uh, you know, getting a 1 on a D12 is a 8.3% chance. But the thing is, though, you're still banking on an entire pool, mm -hmm. and you also need to have multiple successes to actually succeed. Yeah. Considering, in fact, you need a bare minimum of two successes to have a baseline without any repercussions, and that's if you are not dealing with something that you really shouldn't be screwing with. And let's face it, if you're hunting supernatural creatures, you're probably dealing with stuff that you shouldn't be screwing with on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. So the, the difficulty sliding scale where getting extra successes for rolling a one is usually going to come in the, uh, your favor more often than not. So that way you're not totally suffering. But part of the sliding scale that I mentioned with uh, the toolbox is there are optional rules to you know, ratchet up the tension for rolling a 12 or giving extra bonuses for rolling a 1. Because let's face it, some people, when they play a game, they want Delta Green. They want to go in there as a SWAT team, deal with the big, bad supernatural creature, and hope at least one person survives. They probably won't. Other people, <laughs> they probably won't. Somebody will pick up a book, read the title three times, and end the world. Mm -hmm. But that's not my fault. But at the same time, you also have groups that want the Ghostbusters. They want to go ahead and take their ragtag group with technology that's held together with hope, spit, and some bubble gum mm -hmm. and be able to go ahead and kick a god's ass and send it back out into the multiverse. Mm -hmm. You know, like I, I want people to be able to tell the stories they want within these genres. And that's why, again, there's multiple tools for that. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things I noticed in the in the quick start that you that you decided to not go that you said did not go with that some that some that some vet that some vet and some grogs um might might raise an eyebrow for is the is um and is the la is the lack of a lengthy equipment list and I know you've <laughs> had a bit of an aside in the quick start but I'd like to go over your reasoning as to why you. Um, didn't put, did not do an equipment list or, or, a, or in the full version, why you're going very minimalistic with it. So I'm going to, uh, paraphrase a sec, uh, the actual sidebar that I'm putting in the rule book. Mm -hmm. In short, um, we want people to be able to take whatever they think is going to look cool to beat the crap out of whatever these monsters are. Uh, in the Gas Basher universe, the group that is called the Gas Bashers literally took whatever they could in order to defeat the uh, the ghost and other supernatural entities. So if a legend said, here's a spirit jar that gets the job done, sure, they'll have a spirit jar, but they'll also have an unlicensed nuclear accelerator on their back that destabilizes the connection of these entities to our world. Mm -hmm. You know, they could be carrying around a... Uh, 
14 times blessed ancestral weapon that's uh, come through the family her- uh, lineage for you know generations. But they also could just simply have a bunch of blessed silver bullets. It really is just a matter of what do you want it to look like? And that's the whole point. I wanted to let people uh, take a look at what they thought would look really cool as their way to deal with these supernatural entities. Mm-hmm. And, uh, from what I've been seeing so far from uh, some of the higher tier backers, because uh, the higher tier backers were given the option of making their character as part of the canon in the book. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of them has been soundboarding with me for a bit uh, with a couple of his characters and the uh, some of the equipment he's come up with is absolutely hilarious and apropos, and I'm really curious which one we're going to go for because we're seeing everything from a dude that will literally bear hug a ghost, which makes you wonder how is he going to bear hug a ghost, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a gadget for that that he's put together for his character to do that very purpose. And that's why I didn't want an equipment list. I wanted people to put the what's going to look cool ahead of what's going to give me the most pluses. Yeah. So if you like the 2016 Ghostbusters movies where uh, Holtzman came out with those uh, pair of pistols and beat the snot out of a bunch of ghosts, that's going to do just as much damage as the dude in the back with the anti-tank rifle loaded with blessed silver ammunition. Mm-hmm. It's all going to work the same way. It's just some things might be immune. Some things might not. That's where the investigation rules come in. But again, end of the day, the goal is what's going to look cool. Yeah. Now, within the, within that, um, have you put, I know we talked about an, as, an aside in that regard, but have you, have you put together, have you put together a similar aside to make, to, to make in K in K when it comes to some GMs doing, um, What's and this term is a little bit outdated these days, but you're old enough to probably get it. Um, the Monty Hall thing. I'm trying to remember now. That term is just the whole compiling all of the uh, the gear over the years, and yeah, you know, having more gear than sense. Or am I crossing wires? Um, you are to to be to be a little bit more on brand. You are crossing the streams. <laughs> um, first off, Mo- Monty Hall in in this kind of thing is usually spelled H A U L. It's obviously a nod to the ho- to the former host of Let's Make a Deal. Um, it's basically mm-hmm. when GMs are a little bit too liberal with handing out treasure, or it's its gotcha. equivalent. See, I like the idea of um, again, you know, making a nod to like the Ghostbusters cartoons. Mm-hmm. You know, how often do you see Egon come out with an amazing gadget that's only there for one episode? Yeah. And then you never see it again. Or it's out as a toy, and then it's never seen again. Uh, that's kind of where the uh, the investigation rules and the gadget creation rules come in, to where you make something for its individual job, and then it could be never heard of from again, mm-hmm. just because it served its purpose. So, it's again, it's all window dressing. And it helps uh, it helps keep the bookkeeping down. I mean, sure, if you want to go ahead and play uh, accountants and ledgers, I'm not going to stop you. Go ahead and run the books for your franchise and see just how far in the red your uh, your franchise is and how they're going to get out of it by overcharging the next hotel that calls them. Mm-hmm. But that's that's a matter of personal play style. I like the idea of just giving the franchise a rating of one to five of how much money are you actually sitting on. Mm -hmm. And that just makes my life as GM easier because I'm not sitting here counting out every penny that you may or may not have in your bank account. Yeah. (laughs) Same thing with equipment. Uh, There's an equipment rating does the exact same purpose. Mm -hmm. How much gear are you sitting on and what condition is it in? And we just build from that. That's that's why I avoided the uh, the in depth equipment list. I'd have an entire book of just an equipment list, and at that point, you'd be paying for half a book of gear. And where's the point in that? Where's the fun in that? Mm-hmm. 
you know, if I'm going to go ahead and charge money for a book, I'd rather give you some fun content and not just tables. But that's just my personal opinion on value for your dollar. Yeah. Um. But I, th uh, given given the name, given the name, um, have you ha have um. What has been what has been your experience playtesting with pe with people who have a bit more jo genre savviness regard regarding go regarding ghost buses and and the and the assumption that a gas bashers um, um, session would be operating under similar rules with the ghosts. So I haven't done too much uh, with gas bashers as like as the gas bashers. Mm -hmm because I've been tinkering with the mechanic under multiple other guises over the years. So I have the mechanical sound. I know the mechanics are sound. It's just the setting is something that I've been uh, teasing out to people and didn't test for years the same way. So I don't have too much feedback on that beyond people that picked it up. They played a session or they built characters and tinkered with it. Um, I have had a, uh, a group, uh, the uh, the blog Worlds Unending, uh, recently just played a game this weekend and sent me a couple notes and said it was filled with both uh, open mouth horror and side splitting laughter. <laughs> so clearly, mm -hmm. clearly we did something right. <laughs> and uh, but the again, just the idea of it is, you know, people that are genre savvy with Ghostbusters have absolutely embraced it. And those that are more familiar with other other genres, like again Delta Green or SCP, mm -hmm. have been able to adapt some of those elements over to it. Which is why I say this isn't just a Ghostbusters game. It's a it's more, you know closer to a paranormal or paranatural, supernatural hunting instead of just ghosts. Mm -hmm. But trying to fit that into a URL gets a little dicey. <laughs> yeah, that might be a little bit too long for the card. Yep, for uh, especially for uh, you know Kickstarter because they put the full name in there. So putting in a ghost hunting RPG helped me get the point across. But from a mechanical sense or a uh, setting sense, you're hunting more than just ghosts. Mm -hmm. Now, when it, now when it comes to when it comes to the um, when it comes to the defi the um, defining tr the defining traits. Um, mm -hmm. Obvious, obviously, you have three versions of that: reputation, fatal flaw, and and greatest fear. Um, yep. There's a couple of things I'm curious about. One is if there if there's any instances where that where that kind of thing um comes into play comes into play mechanically. And two, um, do you have did you put did you put in any advice for um for people tr for people trying to figure out what would be what would make a good um, instance for the for these three traits. Uh, when you say instance, do you mean usage or do you mean creation? Um, creation. Okay. Uh, from the creation side, I do have a couple examples. Uh, and again, I'm usually citing things that people are that are familiar with the genre might be able to immediately point out and recognize. Mm -hmm. So I mentioned a uh, a paraplegic daredevil. And if you're familiar with Extreme Ghostbusters, that's immediately Garrett. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so anybody who's familiar with that one immediately knows that one all too well. Um, but then if you have uh, a womanizer of a thousand pickup lines, that's absolutely, you know, uh, our good old friend Bill Murray in the original Ghostbusters. Because how often was he trying to pick up every woman he met? Mm -hmm. So... <laughs> You know, point stands. I was making references to things people should be able to recognize, and then I gave examples with the uh, sample characters. And the core rulebook will have the three sample characters of um, Rodriguez, Carlisle, and Delta, as well as the additional characters from the Kickstarter supporters, and possibly some other ones, depending on page count. Mm -hmm. Now, utilization of the uh, of these, like when and how they're used... Um, there are notes in the uh, in the core mechanic that explain when and how they could come about and how they'll impact the role. Mainly, they impact your role by either adding or subtracting from your dice pool. So if it's something that's going to really benefit you, it's going to add to your pool. Mm -hmm. If 
but it's going to slow you down. It's going to take away from your pull. So instead of having that sliding scale of additional successes or, you know, instead of making it harder, I should say, in the success category, it makes it harder in the rolling category because it really takes away how many dice you're rolling Mm -hmm. or it adds to the number of dice you're rolling. And when you factor in that you can create temporary traits to assist with uh, this sort of thing, it all just starts to blend in with the narrative. Yeah. Now, when it now when it comes to the um, when it comes to the attributes under the franchise category, um, mm-hmm. are there any in, are there any instances where you would um, roll the roll roll those? Uh, you actually can, uh, depending on the circumstances, you'll uh, need to roll the franchise instead of rolling for your personal side of things. Mm-hmm. For example, let's say that you need to go ahead and bribe the goon at the door so you can get in. Well, that's going to be a matter of money. And the only thing on your sheet that's going to denote your money is how much funding your franchise has. That's how you're going to be grabbing your dice there, because that's your skill rating. Uh, if you need to go ahead and ad lib ad lib some equipment together, sure, you can go ahead and argue it's a science roll. But sometimes your true limitation isn't how smart you are; it's the equipment that you have to work with, mm-hmm. and that's where your equipment roll is going to come into play instead of your actual science based skills and your reputation. I mean, let's face it: if you show up in uniform and people recognize you, they're going to recognize you for a reason. Yes. And that could help you or hinder you in any number of ways, whether it's crowd control or getting everybody to look at you so your friends can sneak into that building over there and get rid of whatever it is that's hiding in there. You know, there's multiple ways to go about it. Again, this is where the narration and the creativity come into play. Mm -hmm. But there's always everything I put in there has a use. It wasn't just thrown in there for no reason at all. They're put in there to be an alternative approach to the standard stats should a need arise for it. Because mm-hmm. there may be a time somebody will say, you know, my, uh, my shooting skill is not very great, but my equipment is in really top-notch shape. I'm going to rely on it to do the shot instead. Mm-hmm. And the GM might say, you know, that's actually valid. You know, the power of your gear is more important, uh, is going to matter more than your accuracy. Because let's face it, you know, if you have a bazooka and you're hitting something in a room, <laughs> you know, splash damage is a bitch. We all know this. If you played enough video games, we know this to be true. Yeah, um, a bullet may have your name on it, but a rocket sa- only says to whom it may concern. And don't forget that a uh, mortar is, uh, you know, written as Deer Quadrant. Yeah. You know, Deer Quadrant Coordinates. Mm-hmm. And... Oh, and um, of course, of course, uh, of course, I have, of course, um, the way to rationalize you rationalize using using mortar fire to deal with to deal with a supernatural threat would be interesting. Um, I know I say there's no kill like overkill, but still. Well, considering the fact that when you get into the higher tier of threats, uh, oversized kaiju are a valid option to be dealing with. Mortar fire is not overkill when, you know, that explosion is just a pinprick on Godzilla's back. Mm-hmm. Sorry, not sorry. It's, I was ready for kaiju. I yeah. brought kaiju. Um, but that brings me to to um, advancement. How how do you have advancement working in this setup? Is it a case of, of, the, of the standard experience as currency kind of, kind of approach, or do you have a different method? A little bit of column A and a little bit of column B. I do have standard, uh, you know, like advancement points, XP style uh, pulls going on to where you can pile them up, spend them, go from there. But I did include a sidebar that included an alternative option for milestones because some people prefer milestones or an episodic progression. So I wanted to make sure that everybody that walked into this had the option that fit best for what they wanted. So if you don't want to deal with math of, okay, I have this many XP, but I need this times this, you don't need to worry about that. Mm-hmm. You can literally say, all right, it's been three game sessions, and uh, GM says, I can do this now. Okay. Three game sessions says, I can do this. Done. 
So I wanted to give options like that. And there's been enough uh, games that have moved to more of a milestone advancement mm -hmm. that uh, I'm fond of it personally. But I also know it's not the default for a lot of players. So I stuck with the XP as well. I tried to hit that best of both worlds. Yeah, I can get I can get that. Yeah, now, that line between toolkit and complete game. <laughs> um. Now, when it come, now, I will admit, I will admit that when I saw that when I saw the fun when I saw the funding, um, stat, what immediately came to mind was the was the uh, was the dots and resources um setup that's in World of Darkness. Is it similar to that? Yes. Um, again, it's just like the resources dots. It is a um, a simplified uh, numerical representation of how much funding and how many how much monetary resource you have at your fingertips. Mm -hmm. So, again, since it's usually rated like one to five, you know, a one is going to be you're barely getting by. You know, uh, your building's in disrepair. You're probably not going to be affording too much. Uh, while your higher levels are going to be, you know, much better off, you know, could probably buy out a small island for their headquarters if they really want to, just flush with funds. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's, how, it's a nod, but it's, again, just simply more of just a simpler way of handling money instead of how many dollars am I carrying? All right. And since, since there is a nod for, um, how to make the game more of an international to actually set up a gas basher franchise in another country. Mm -hmm. Totally easier to, uh, <laughs> to have a simple system like that instead of how much money are you carrying? Yeah. Now I want to go, I want to delve a little bit into, into the lore end of the equation. Yeah. And always fun. Try me. I'll <laughs> <laughs> I'll start. I'll start with the is so given the fact that we're we're still dealing with a lar a largely contemporary setting, is it a mm -hmm. case where where um where ghost hunting has been around in one form or another for gen for generations, or was there was it a case where there was some some sort of accident that ha some sort of accident or some kind of um shit hitting the fan moment in the in the recent past that. Um, th that thrust this, that thrust the whole paranormal thing into a bigger light than it was in the past. So this is where we get that little bit of column A, little bit of column B. Mm -hmm. There have always been ghost stories. You know, there's always been Loch Ness monster sightings or Bigfoot sightings, or you know, some sort of horror story involving a creature that you will never utter the name of for fear you will get its attention. Mm -hmm. And those are all global global stories you pick up any book on folklore and you will find dozens of these ghost stories mm -hmm. you know common cryptids the works there's there's ghost stories throughout you know throughout history throughout time but in the gas basher lore you know while there these monster stories have always existed no one's been able to truly prove whether or not they were real because you know you always have your doubts you know, taxidermists would make fun things just to go ahead and get a rise out of the locals. You know, that sort of problem. Mm -hmm. But in uh, the Gas Bashers universe, it wasn't until the 80s after Mount St. Helens erupted when shit hit the fan. And that's when uh, all of the weird, ghosty, supernatural stuff just cranked up to an 11. And things got really weird really fast. Mm -hmm. Uh, the uh, the basic premise in the universe is, you know, the ongoing theory, I should say, is our world and a supernatural world are coexisting, and our world kind of supersedes the other one, but sometimes that world bleeds into ours. And usually, these things come about most often around the time of a natural disaster, because usually when a natural disaster occurs, when you look at mythology and folklore... There's always a story of a creature that caused it or a creature seen nearby or afterwards. You know, plagues are caused by vampires. Mm -hmm. uh, tidal waves are caused by a kraken. Uh, the volcanoes caused, uh, volcanoes eruptions caused by an angry god. Mm -hmm. You know, there's always an entity that caused the, the issue. At least, again, in the past. Mm 
in history and mythology. So I decided to spin that in a big thing happened. It released the pressure valve, and now enough of that has bled into our world to make this even more common. So now, you know, Grandma Gertrude's sitting in your kitchen. She's been dead for 40 years, but she's in your kitchen insulting your paint job. You know, Bigfoot sightings are far more common than they've ever been. And uh, let's just not talk about the tentacles that are coming out of your sink. (laughs) And that's when the gas bashers came about. Um, I Basically, they started out in the U.S. because you had ballooning military spending and Cold War uh, scare and everything else like that. So you got these bunch of, uh, let's just politely call them uh, eccentric individuals that decided to study the uh, supernatural and how it's impacting our world. Mm -hmm. They wanted to find a way to uh, dissipate or contain these things. So they took, uh, you know, government military spending, weaponized some things and decide let's go monster hunting. Mm -hmm. And the reason why it was done in the U S is because let's face it, you know, we have some of the most lax weapon laws in the world. So, of course, let's give a bunch of bozos the weapons or uh, the money to make weapons, right? Because mm-hmm. <laughs> America, that's I had to do the tongue in cheek. It was there. Yeah. So, and I have a full section on that, like with the uh, the nod for our international readers that this isn't some American white savior joke. This is literally a I'm poking fun at uh, America's gun laws and military uh, ballooning military spending. Because, let's face it, when you look at the history of the 80s, it was pretty crazy. Mm -hmm. So, you take that, they found a way to actually hunt down these entities, and decide they're going to make bank on it. And uh, that's what they did. That's when uh, the gas bashers came to uh, to actually be a entity that was setting up franchises around the U.S. And thanks to uh, U.S. government interference and the creation of the Bureau of Paranormal Investigation... Or inspection, sorry. Bureau of Paranormal Inspection. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, those two combined, you now have a government uh, body that does things. You have a uh, privately owned body that does these things. And they're kind of at odds with each other. Set up, you know, elsewhere in the world as well. And they're literally all just a bunch of monster hunters out trying to do their own thing. Mm -hmm. Then we hit 2008. So from like the mid 80s to 2008, everybody's making bank on the number of ghosts and supernatural creatures they're hunting down. You know, because everybody's got a ghost somewhere in their attic, right? Well, around 2008, uh, with uh, that string of natural disasters that most of us don't like recalling that occurred in that one single year, (laughs) the uh, supernatural just stopped. The, uh, you know, everything that was uh, captured went dormant and everything that was being hunted just kind of disappeared. And cases were almost non-existent and mostly just stopped coming in altogether. So from 2008 through 2020, nothing had happened with anything supernatural. Gas basher groups were basically closing up shop. The corporate sellout groups were just moving to R&D with what they had. And uh, the government agencies just kind of reallocated. And then 2020 hit. And as we all just witnessed in the year 2020, we had a number of oh-so-wonderful disasters. And that was our kickstart for the supernatural coming back. And gas bashers uh, picked back up. So now you have these people that are uh, picking up technology that hasn't been used or tested in the last, you know, 10-plus years hoping it still works and going to go get grandma Gertrude out of your kitchen and back in the box where she belongs. For whatever, for whatever reason, when, when you met, when you mentioned disasters, while it would, while it would be, it would be very, it would be very obvious to go with, to go with the coof as one of those disasters. Um, I'd probably, I'd probably go with some, I'd probably go with something a little less obvious, but still provides a good amount of potential. That being a period of time last year when a good chunk of the West Coast was literally on fire. Uh-huh. <laughs> 2020 carried a number of big natural disasters. 
And that is where, again, the pressure cooker theory came in again, um, because 2020 set a lot of records of certain natural disasters. And some of those records are greater than the record set in 2008. So it was, uh, it was interesting to use that, uh, bit of history as, uh, as a guy. And it's kind of sad to use natural disasters, but again, utilizing my love of mythology and knowing the number of times that supernatural creatures have been used as the scapegoat of natural disasters, I just thought it was a little too apropos. Mm -hmm. And well, we've we've had um, we've had we've we've had fo we've had folklore characters over over the years be be t be tied to um, be tied to certain be tied to certain. Nat natural events, not necessarily disasters, but just events, like say Paul Bunyan creating the Badlands. Mm -hmm. So the I, the concept is not as far fetched as some as some people would l would like to think. Um, Precisely, which is again why I went with it. <laughs> yeah. Now, the way you the way you describe the way you described it, it's it's it sounds like um. When it comes to when it comes to, because you because in the in the book in or at least in the uh, Kickstarter page, you talk about three prim three primary organizations when it comes to people who set up gas basher um, franchises the B mm -hmm. the um, BPI the old the old guard and the sellouts. Um, yes. Now, would it be fair of me to say that the BP that the BPI is the is what is one of the more "Quote unquote organized approaches, but there's the downside of have of having somebody to answer to. It, this is one of those yes, but no. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, you're actually going to be getting a uh, a little bit of a secret that uh, hasn't been announced in any of the other interviews I've done to date. So you've heard it here first. Mm -hmm. The only people that know these tidbits are those that had access to the book as part of playtest. So congratulations." <laughs> Uh, there's a note of uh, trade secrets in the book regarding each of the three uh, types of organizations, mm -hmm. uh, what their goals are, and uh, how they are going to impact role-playing as well as the story. So you have the original Old Guard Gas Bashers. These are the people that signed up, whether because they wanted to make money or because they want to do right by their communities to get rid of these supernatural creatures. And they do so by whatever means they need to they will capture they will destroy they will contain they will clean up whatever it takes as long as you're paying them at the end of the day they're happy <laughs> you know they're, they're a privately run entity it's the way it works uh but that's that's the gas bashers for you there are old guard original group that's what they do the bpi on the other hand it's very much like every other alphabet soup agency there's a strict hierarchy. You get your orders. You're following your orders. You got people you got to listen to. You're not going to be able to deviate from the mission too often. You got to act within the confines of the law, obviously. Mm -hmm. And the big thing is BPI, nine times out of ten, prefers to destroy supernatural threats instead of capture. Their view is it's a threat. And its very existence is a continued threat to, you know, to uh, civilians as well as government. So, therefore, it should be destroyed. And, you know, since these things are already dead for the most part, or, you know, considered to be animals uh, by other standards, that's how they stand on it. Mm -hmm. But if you just so happen to see a group of BPI agents out there with traps, snares, and geared up like a SWAT team, just write it up as a loss, go home, and grab a drink. Because you know, whatever it is they're trying to capture, it means more than your life and your paycheck. So just go home. <laughs> uh, the, the running joke I had with one of my players is, um, you know, what would a, what would the military industry complex do if they got their hands on a werewolf and could pull werewolf adrenaline. Mm -hmm. What sort of drugs would they make from that? Uh, what else could they make from any of the other supernatural creatures that you see on a regular basis? 
you know, what if you pulled uh, the plates off of, you know, a Xenomorph, for example, just mm -hmm. throwing an idea out there. If you bypass the, uh, the whole issue with the acid, what can you do with Xenomorph Carapace? I mean, that's pretty... And that's that's why I made the nod there of like what would the military do if they could weaponize some elements of the supernatural? That's where the capture comes in. Mm -hmm. The sellouts, on the other hand, the third flavor of Gast Basher, they will nine times out of ten go for a capture instead of a kill. Uh, the sellouts are actually groups of individuals that um, are hired on to a corporate-run franchise. So imagine what would happen if, in your community, no one could afford the franchising rights for the gas bashers. So, you know, you can't afford the rights, you can't afford the, uh, the permits, the licenses, and the equipment to open up your local franchise. Mm -hmm. But, you know, a uh, big restaurant chain with, uh, you know, big golden loops just so happens to say, hey, how about uh, we go ahead and we front your cost? It becomes a tax write-off for them, and uh, you just now are employed by them instead. It's now a guaranteed paycheck, and you get to do the job. Mm -hmm. But now you're literally, like, corporate-owned in the process. And the reason why it's uh, capture instead of kill? Well, let's just say you don't ask about what's in the chicken nugget recipe. Or if I... A, um... Or you don't... You're gonna... I... I keep thinking. I keep thinking of a certain line from Mad Men. You're gonna have a. You're gonna need to have a stronger stomach if you're gonna be in the kitchen seeing how the sausage is made. Yes, and of course, you know it's not just on the restaurant side. Like, can you imagine what would happen if big tech companies found a way to harness the sort of uh, electricity generated or the energy generated by spectral beings? Mm -hmm. Can you imagine if an app designer found a way to make an app as addicting as? A, uh, as the apps found on a phone that's been imbued with the glamour of the Fae. Like, you know, that's, that's why it's always capture instead of kill, because they want to find out how these things work and how they can use it to make money. Mm -hmm. So if they can make a battery that is literally run off of ghosts, I mean, you know, no more power bill, right? <laughs> so that's the... Those are the, the, you know, a gist of the, the big secret of the three. You know, uh, each one of those has their goals about how they operate, why they operate, and why they do the job they do. It will impact how you play the game, obviously. Mm -hmm. And if your gaming table just so happens to have one member from each of those groups, they're going to be butting heads about how the job is going to get handled. That brings that brings me to one qu that brings me to one question, in mm -hmm. this in this kind of in this kind of setting, um, for two things actually. First off, would it be fair of me to say that there's no universal rules when it comes to dealing with supernatural threats? No, no, cr no, ca no, um, no, tip no typical proton pack and ca and tra and trap kind of setup. And the other question is is um is um, territory conflict, um, a, a issue, a issue between franchises. Uh, the territory conflict between franchises is more of a plot element than anything, mm -hmm. uh, because it would just be an entertaining thing to throw in if, uh, it just so happened that the corporate sellouts were getting to your case and bagging your, uh, your job before you even got the call. You know, makes you wonder what's going on, right? Uh, or if they just keep making you look bad, like what's going on here? Like that is absolutely story element mm -hmm. and um, is one of those things that I would probably sneak into a, uh, a bit of content down the line for one of the expansions I've been already thinking about. Yes, uh, I'm already thinking of expansions because why stop at one? It's habitual. <laughs> that, uh, that and the uh, we've estab we've established beforehand that one that. Once the ideas start co start coming in, um, they don't stop. Exactly. So I'm already planning uh, potential expansions that may just be PDF only, just because of well, you know, the constantly doing print runs gets expensive. Mm -hmm. So, but again, one of the ideas is talking about specific parts of the world, the things they fight, uh, like the problems they face in those areas. 
and some of those problems are butting heads between different organizations. So, you know, can you imagine Silicon Valley where you have all the tech bros each having their own individual corporate run gas basher group? And then you have the classic gas bashers and BPI in there as well. Can you imagine how cutthroat that would get? That would make a very hilarious game if you go comedy, or it could be a very dark game if you decide to go dark horror. So yes, valid valid way to play the game. Why not both? <laughs> that that is also a valid way to go. Uh, now, as for the uh, the silver bullet approach of you know a universal way to deal with everything, that's kind of what the bashers tried to do by creating the uh, the tech that they did. The idea was to find some way to destabilize the supernatural entity's connection to the physical world so it could then either dissipate back to its plane of existence or be contained in a way that, you know, could be stored somewhere safely. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't always work. You know, some things you run into are so ancient and so powerful or just so cursed that there's no way to kill it unless you undo the curse that caused it in the first place. Or you may get rid of it, but it'll be back next week because it's a repeating curse on a bloodline or something else like that. Mm -hmm. This is where, uh, again, the investigation rules I built in come into play. Because sure, you can find the creature, beat the crap out of it, throw it into a uh, trap, and then throw it in a container and you're good to go. Or so you think. Next day, it's back out again. Why is it back out again? Hmm, I wonder why. And then you continue on. That's where you have to find out why it exists. What is it? What gives it its power? How can you truly put a stop to it? Repeat the process. Now, when it com now um, when it comes to, when it comes to that, even though this thing is going to be a hundred pages, do you have a few pages set aside for a um, sample bestiary? Yep. Uh, at this moment, I have. Um, I think I have seven creatures ready to go uh, because creatures are in uh, threat categories of one through five uh, where one is like your little simple piddly oh it looks cute but it could probably kill you if it tries Slimer but then again, uh, Slimer would ride the line between one and two depending on uh, on what you're looking at like a one is more like uh, what would happen if your cell phone were to be haunted uh, two is closer to Slimer. Um, something like uh, the Stay Puffed Marshmallow Man falls into like the four range, while Zool would be closer to a five. You know, you're talking like, you know, planar, uh, you know, gods of uh, other existence are threat fives. Um, Kaiju that are not gods, you know, probably a four. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, but because of that, I purposely kept the, uh, the current bestiary short because one of the, uh, the tiers I have in the, um, in the Kickstarter is to allow backers to create their own monster and put it into the book as a collection of field notes. And the last thing I want to do is say, I'm putting my own monster in here and find out that it's a carbon copy of what somebody else wants to do. So I have a couple extra pages of uh, creatures I'm ready to plug in here, depending on what art shows up and what other people decide to make. So my goal is to have, pardon me, my goal is to have the four from the Kickstarter backers, the seven I currently have ready to go, and probably sneak in another uh, three to six, depending on page count, because page count matters. Since you brought up the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask, where does Vigo fit on this scale? Vigo, Vigo, Vigo. Vigo... See, that's, that's where Vigo gets a little dicey. Vigo, as a standalone, isn't really all that threatening or powerful. Like, Vigo is... In a way, he's powerful and threatening, but it's the stuff around him that's really the higher threat. Vigo himself is more of just a narrative target, mm -hmm. while everything else is the thing that would be quantified with the individual stats. If that makes sense. 
Yeah, I can I can see where you go. I can see where you're going with that. Because you know, if I were to say Vigo is a threat three because he's really just there, gets slimed and shot, and that's it. But all the stuff that led up to it is what matters with Vigo. Vigo is a bigger threat than Zul because the amount of investigation that had to go into stopping Vigo was so much more than what we saw in Ghostbusters one to go ahead and stop. Uh, yeah, you know, the situation with Zool and Gozer. Mm-hmm. Now, so in, that's the difference. Now, throughout this, you've meant you've mentioned the investigation system that you have that you have in mind for it for um mm-hmm. for the for for gas bashers. And mm-hmm. now, when it comes to when it comes to the idea of investigate investigation focused play. Um, a lot of people's minds obviously go to Gumshoe because it's trying to go against that whole pa- pass fail attitude with um, dice rolls. That and mm-hmm. that and the way it do- the way it does its skill system as a whole. Um, what approach were you trying to go with when it came to inv- investigation to kind of avoid that pass fail um, problem? Um, I was handling investigation more like a progress track. Uh, solely because uh, you can only get you only do so much investigation within a certain period of time, and you know you you uh, dictate how you're going to do that. You do the actions associated with it. You perform the role. You calculate the number of successes. You bank them. You deal with any repercussions that occur. Progress the story as you go. And sometimes, even if you don't have the full investigation, you may have made enough progress that you can jump to a conclusion and do something really cool. Totally viable. Sometimes you're going to instigate a fight with the big bad and you didn't finish everything, but you still somehow pull ahead. It's going to be hard, but you can still probably do it. But the uh, investigation has a, um, has a counter track. So you have the standard track of your investigation track. You have to fill your investigation track to... Uh, basically create the uh, the criteria you need to determine how can I go ahead and defeat this thing. You know, it's it's got this ancient bloodline curse. I need to defuse the curse. Well, how do I defuse the curse? Well, to defuse the curse, I have to find the book. Well, I found the book. But now I have to translate it from Latin. And Latin and I don't get along. And you know, like that's that's where the narrative comes into play. But the mechanic is just a okay. You know, you're just building up the number of successes to hit the point. But it's not just a go from scene roll, scene roll, because there's other stuff that's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Which is where the flip side comes in of the town clock. The town clock mechanic is the one I alluded to that was pulled from the kaiju game I was working on. As the game progresses. The, cl- the town clock ticks onward. And as it ticks onward, certain things speed it up. So, say for example, if you, know, you are rolling terribly and you cause a ton of collateral damage trying to deal with a small entity that broke out from your containment unit, you may have just uh, empowered the creature you're trying to stop in the process. You know, you may have just destroyed a node that was keeping it locked away. Mm-hmm. Insert other narrative here. Town clock progresses, and at the end of each scene, you're rolling a 12-sided die. If you roll under the town clock, something bad happens. That something bad could be anything from a major NPC has been captured or incapacitated... Um, the unstoppable monster makes an attack and you need to find some way to keep it from getting its next victim. Insert plot hook here. And there's some sample hooks in the book to explain what you can do when the town clock activates. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, once the clock itself hits 12, that's when uh, the big bad is going to do whatever nasty thing it's been building up for. So if it just so happens that, you know, you're dealing with Cthulhu, well, town clock hit 12, Cthulhu's coming out of the ocean. I hope you're ready. <laughs> congratulations, yeah. you're all fucked. Or congratulations, you're going to have calamari for the next six months. There is no in-between. Only Zul. Well, 
I'm pr well. I'm pretty sure after I'm pretty sure after the end of the first Ghostbusters movie, there w everybody had to deal the um all the local exterminators were probably having a lot of business dealing with all the hornets. Mm-hmm. Yep. So yeah, that's the uh, that's the madness there. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's a uh, it's kind of a twofold thing, you know. On one hand, you have the um, the ongoing investigation. On the other hand, you have a counter investigation in the form of the town clock ticking down. You can do things to slow it down, but again, it's a it's this back and forth of what's happening. What are you doing to? Uh, act against it, and what is the entity doing to progress its own needs. Mm -hmm. And who knows what's going to happen? You know, there's uh, some sliding tools in there for GMs, of course. Uh, if they don't feel like rolling every scene and just simply say, you know, it's not going to tick this scene because this is just really cool and I really like what you did. Or it is going to tick this scene, but, you know, XYZ reasons are going to occur. There's, I, I'm again trying to give that toolbox so people can get the right feel, even just session to session. Mm -hmm. And when when I looked at when I looked at the section regarding combat, mm -hmm. one thing that cert that certainly stood out to me is the is the fact that is the fact that combat um, when it comes to dealing with damage instead of Providing a dedicated damage track, whether that whether that be wounds, whether that be hit, whether that be hit points, whether that be marks, what ha what have you. Instead, you had it that damage goes straight to attributes, which yep. in a weird in a weird roundabout way reminded me of the behemoth that is Traveler. Um. God, oh, I hadn't even thought of that. I haven't read Traveler in years. I, ju I I may it may be recency biased for for me thinking that because I just did a review of the uh, mongoose second edition traveler a few weeks ago. Okay. But when it but what I'm curious about is what what um what led you to taking that route. So one of the um again uh, been tinkering with a lot of mechanics and um, there. Are two uh two things that inspired this uh one of them was um the cipher system mm -hmm. uh mainly that you can spend your attributes to uh you know increase your chances of success uh but of course your attributes are also going to be your hit points so it's your you know your get out of jail free pool as well as your i'm going to stay alive pool and i really liked that mechanic and uh, that was one of the inspirations behind it. But I also needed a way to really make combat have teeth. To be more than just a, well, I roll, I added my bonuses, do I hit? Now it's a, okay, well, now I have to plan carefully because if I fail, I get hurt. And getting hurt means it's going to be harder for me to do my next task. Mm -hmm. It also means that it's not always going to be a game of I shoot it. Sometimes it becomes a, well, I'm, I'm so hurt physically, there's no way I'm going to shoot it. How can I outthink my way through this? And now you can utilize a different stat instead mm -hmm. and still potentially get the job done. And that's, it's just the idea of there's a certain diminished return going on here where, you know, you're taking the risk, it's wearing you out, and there's the possibility that you're going to have to get creative with an alternative way besides focusing on just one way to solve a problem. Well, and that's one. That's why I did it. Yep. Well, there's more than one way to skin a cat. Ah, oh, you say that as my cat jumps in my lap. <laughs> See, this. the best part is I did not plan for that. <laughs> nope. <laughs> I don't know if that, I don't know if I should be impressed or horrified. A little bit of both. Uh, that my cat here that seems to be the theme, is... That seems to be the theme tonight of a little bit of both. <laughs> yep. Both? Both. Both. Both, both is good. good. Jinx. <laughs> yep. If I'm, in, if, I'm uh, in, if, I'm in, if I'm in your area, you owe me a drink. Oh. Uh, but 
with all, with all that in mind, what do you ha what are you shooting for as far as a release window? So the uh, I have on the Kickstarter the announcement that I want to have everything out and in hand by December, mm -hmm. by the end of the calendar year. Now that said, um, realistically speaking, if things go as I'm planning, uh, and this is why you know this is unofficial hope. Uh, this is the stuff that's not written, not in paper. Do not use this as an example. This is not legally binding, et cetera, et cetera. I'd like to have everything out by Halloween. I, uh, my goal here is the book is essentially already written. I have placeholders for the Kickstarter uh, backers for their stuff to be added. Um, I've already, I'm working with artists now. I'm still getting art coming in to add to it. I have some stock art that's been modified to be used as really cheesy ads. As you may have noticed, there's some bad advertisements plugged into the uh, quick start. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm sticking with that because that's the kind of humor I wanted to stick with gas bashers. So I have those scattered in there as placeholders to help with the art situation. Uh, but if we... Let's see. I just got the last sample character art uh, today, or not today, uh, this weekend, and I just got a uh, draft of one of the cover ideas today from one of my artists. Uh, I'm waiting on the other one to uh, get back because it's going to be a joint project between two of the three artists. Uh, the third artist is working on some other sketches for me for some of the monsters that I have on the docket that, again, we're hoping to sneak in or at least use the art as filler to inspire people to make their own monster stats based on the picture. Mm -hmm. So um, art is one of the snags, uh, but really the book, the core elements of the book itself, the text, the um, layout, everything else like that is basically done uh, with the exception of the Kickstarter backer material. Mm -hmm. Once the Kickstarter ends, the uh, work in progress PDF will actually be sent out to all Kickstarter backers. So the Kickstarter ends on uh, July 31st. My goal is that night or that afternoon, basically once it ends, a link will be sent out to all Kickstarter backers with a copy of the current version of the PDF. Be missing a couple things like hyperlinks and art, but the core rules and everything else will be there. Mm -hmm. um, I've already started ordering some of the... Um, the physical merch to go with it, uh, like the patches. Uh, Malgi's already making dice. Uh, she's already gotten, I think, all the glow-in-the-dark dice ready to go. Mm -hmm. And uh, she's currently mass-producing the... Um, well, I say mass-producing. She's you know a one-woman army when it comes to making dice. Mm -hmm. uh, but she's making our translucent green dice for the, um, uh, the franchise holder uh, tier. So we're... She's... She's at it making the dice. If everything goes well, emphasis on the word well, I should have the patches and some of the other physical merch in around the same time Kickstarter sends me the Kickstarter funds sometime in the middle of next month. Mm -hmm. If I get the, uh, the higher tier backers to get back to me, um, we're going to start getting the art plugged out for the uh, create your own monster and create your own basher. I've already gotten one character and uh, one monster already written up. So I just got three more of each uh, waiting in the wings. And again, working on the artwork side. And if all goes well, if we can get all the artwork done next month or within the next month, I send it in to mix them. I get everything mid-September. And then I could start mailing out. Uh, if in an ideal world, if nothing goes wrong, all the merch makes it in, and we don't have a problem with uh, the postal service and COVID, I think we can get it out to a number of backers before Halloween. But again, that's my goal, personal goal. The realistic one is because of delays in shipping, there may be a problem with dice manufacture, etc. I gave myself the window for the rest of this calendar year. But the PDF will be out July 31st, at least to backers. Mm -hmm. 
and I'll cer I'll certainly be looking forward to that. And I'd be remiss if I didn't offer my congratulations for managing to get um, well over your initial go your initial goal. Um, at the time of this recording, you're at three point three thousand when you're only asking for two thousand. Yes, I purposely had a very small goal with this. Um, quite literally, all the money that's coming into this is going to uh, pay for a print run. And then just about everything else in the uh, that's coming into this is going to the artists. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they're producing the art um, and I'm trying to pay them better than the going wages because I find some of the... Um, some of the practices in the RPG community when it comes to art are a little predatory and I don't want to do that. So I'm, I'm making sure they get paid. I myself won't be seeing much of anything out uh, to my pockets in this. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, I'll have a handful of books at the end of it that I'll be able to hopefully, uh, hopefully sell and distribute after the fact, but everything else is just going to support the artists. And like I like I said, I'll cert I'll certainly be looking forward to seeing how this how this um develops. But with that with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto my temple and enjoy the enjoy the madness here. It's very much appreciated being able to come in and enjoy a different flavor of madness instead of my own. And anytime you see fit to return, whether it's to whether it's to our whether it's to argue over, um, over which ghost, over which of the two Ghostbusters movies is the better one, or just to, or just to, um, follow up on more of Gas Bashers, the door is always open. Um, I would be more than willing to do that. And again, you know, as a fellow lover of tabletop, I my door is always open to, uh, you know, take an invite, and then I'll just bust through your temple door like the Kool Aid Man and say, "All right, what are we talking about?" <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, as I always say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Sounds like a plan. <laughs> and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time to list to listen to our little our little misadventures here in in the temple. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then. On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gimming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!